Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time again for another edition of the Gardening Simplified Show with me, Rick Weiss, and Stacy Hervella. Hey, Stacy, tell you what, I'm loving the color outside right now. Oh, it is going bananas. Every single day, it's an escalation in beauty. I tell you what, the landscape is like celebrating. You know, they did their job, they did their work, and now it's like, well, before we shut down for winter, Let's party. It does definitely feel that way out there. And I can't wait for Plants on Trial today because you're going to talk about one of my favorite plants. And I'm not going to give it away, so don't worry. But uh, folks, you're, you're not going to want to miss this. What a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. And I love the plants, uh, Stacy, that can't seem to make up their minds. In other words, some have brilliant yellows and some reds and some orange, but there are some where you get the whole kaleidoscope on the foliage. I Love personally, that. you know, it's hard to say. I was going to say I like those best, but then when I was thinking about everything that I've seen, you know, the red maples just turn that incredible, consistent, glowing red, mm-hmm. and that's enough to stop you on your tracks. Oh, amazing, amazing. Now, three factors influence autumn leaf color. Obviously, the leaf pigments, which are going to be our words of the day today, and the length of night now as the days get shorter. And by the way, coming up in branching news, we'll talk about, do I dare bring it up? Daylight saving time? I have opinions on that. When I saw that was on your plan for branching news, I'm like, "Mm, everybody buckle in. I look forward to that. Buckle in, you've been warned. And of course, weather. Now, I don't think it's a big leaf of my imagination that we need sunny days and cold nights. It does something to the foliage that makes it more brilliant. It, am I right about that? You are right. We don't necessarily need them. The, the trees will still turn color if we don't have that combination of conditions. But definitely cool nights and sunny days are the perfect combination for the brightest most vivid and consistent colors. Yeah, I think the yellows and oranges, those pigments that are masked, I'm going to use that word, masked by chlorophyll during the uh, growing season, um, they're there anyhow, and they're going to show up. But I think the reds are more brilliant based on what the weather situation is like in fall. But that's just my opinion, you know, and I'm sticking with it. Well, I think that you are correct. Yellows, I think, do tend to have more of a range. You can find some very dull yellows, not to knock those plants, but the reds always seem to just have that glowing, ruby-like translucence almost. Yeah. So let's get to the words of the day because I need your help, Stacey. Like I said last week, I no longer use pronounce.com or show me how to pronounce it or whatever.com. I've got you. So here we go. Four different pigments. Chlorophyll. Now I get that fill at the end. That's got to mean foliage or leaf, right? That is correct. It means leaf. Okay. So chlorophyll. Now that's the green leaves that or the correct. green in the foliage. Now the next one's a little tougher. So help me out. Xanthophylls, which are the yellows. Did I get that right? That is correct. Xantho is the word in Latin for, uh, or Greek rather, for yellow. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, that would make sense. <laughs> so it's the Xanthophils. Sounds like a rock group. That would be a great name for a band. That's getting you that yellow color on the trees. And then, of course, the carotenoids. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's what I would say. Outstanding. Yeah. It, cool. So it's not spelled like carrot that you eat, but the carotenoids are responsible for the orange color of carrots as well as the orange color in foliage. And speaking of color in fruit or foliage, a key pigment would be anthocyanins. Is that right? That is correct. Four for four. (laughs) Adriana's smiling over there. I'm four for four today. Now, those are the reds, and uh, they're also responsible for the color that we find in things like blueberries. It gives us that really, I don't know, that gravitas in the foliage, that color. Right, blue and purple as well as red. Because, of course, that purple derives from blue and red, but... You know, I had a friend explain to me at one time that uh, looking at this from a financial standpoint, trees are capitalists. In what way? Well, in spring, they make an investment. It takes a lot of effort to push that foliage out, right? Sure does. Within two or three weeks, they've got a return on their investment, absorbing sunlight and doing what it is plants do. And then after that, 
it's just pure profit. That's how we get growth out of trees. And then that's why I say in fall when the chlorophyll breaks down, we begin that celebration. Yes, and it is a great time of the year to celebrate that because I'll, it's a fantastic year for foliage here. Oh, it, I think this is a primo year, and 2022. You know, I, now that we have the podcast as well as the radio show and the YouTube channel, I think a lot of our listeners might not be in Michigan and uh, they should see the amazing video you made celebrating Michigan's fabulous fall color. So we'll, we'll put that in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. So if you haven't seen any great fall color yet or you're from a part of the world or the country that doesn't get amazing fall color, you can check out that video and get your fix in a big way. Thank you very much. Yes, that is, uh, boy, I love fall color. Just love it. Don't you love just like when you were a kid jumping in leaf piles? Although, you know, I have a memory. Again, I'm a baby bloomer. Okay, and I have a memory of uh, dad raking the leaves to the curb and everyone in the neighborhood burning the leaves. I mean, the smoke was thick. I remember those days. Yeah, there's still out here in the country a lot of people who burn their leaves. It seems a little bit um, crazy to me because leaves are so valuable. You know, yes, uh, raking leaves is a lot of work, but particularly if you compost, and I do, I've been known to actually take people's leaf bags same and here. I now. collect leaves. <laughs> yes. Because they're the perfect brown. And, you know, one of the issues if you're composting in winter and you're getting a lot of greens or the food waste that you're trying to, to transform into compost, uh, you need the browns to balance that out. Otherwise, it gets slimy. It doesn't decompose quickly. Good point. And so if you are stockpiling people's dry leaves, which I do, okay, not like to the point where it's a little bit creepy, but, you know, so I have a good supply. Don't give out your address. <laughs> I will not. Okay. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's very, very useful. And, uh, yeah, I think that, um, you can use leaves as a mulch if you want. You can use sure. them to stuff around plants that are more tender, uh, that you need to protect. And of course you can use them for compost. So lots of good things to do with leaves. Absolutely. You know, you think about it. I mentioned the trees being capitalists and then making a profit, but you know, they give back, obviously they give us oxygen and they give us this wonderful compost in fall that we can, uh, work with. So it makes no sense to me to burn that compost or those leaves because money does grow on trees, in my opinion. Yes. It's worth it. So now I got I got something I got to run by you a minute, Stacy. I want to see if you believe this. Um, I was doing some research as I was taking some fall pictures and there was an individual that has an insect theory and it suggests that the bright fall colors may be a warning to insects that this tree, in order to produce those brilliant bright colors, must be healthy, so don't lay your eggs on that tree because it has chemical defenses. Now, I know that that's a stretch, but you think there that holds any water? I, mm, I know I, I'm putting I, you on the you spot. You are putting me on the spot. I need to think about that a lot because, yeah, you know, here. I love insects. Um, but the fact is that a lot of insects have already laid their eggs well before the right. trees were showing any color. Right. So, um, you know, and there's other factors too. Actually, insects can sense or pick up on the pheromones that stressed plants are putting out. So exactly. they aren't really necessarily seeing the color, but they're like, whoa, this this plant stressed out. Seems like a good opportunity for me to, you know, burrow in and see what kind of damage I can do. I think you nailed it. And I think that's probably what that individual's theory was or along that line. But Anyhow, fall color, great. Love the fall color. Every year is a little different. You know, trees can be kind of moody like people. That's for sure. Contingent on the weather, day length, moisture, how much moisture there is in the ground, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to say 2022 so far has been a banner year. And we'll talk more color coming up with Plants on Trial. Stacy's going to introduce you to one of my absolute, I'm trying not to say it. <laughs> you, can, you can say it. No, Little we're going to save okay. it for the next segment. All right. Plants on Trial coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Stay tuned. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacey Hervella, and I'm here in our studio with Rick Weiss. We're talking fall, and we're going to put an excellent fall plant on trial here. But before we do, Rick, I wanted to... Uh, share with you and our listeners a little fall triumph that I have enjoyed this year. Oh, I'm all ears. I have had my first fig harvest. Oh, I like that. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we had a little fig plant that my in-laws neighbors had given us a couple of years ago. 
And we planted it on the south side of our house in a somewhat protected area. Okay. So it's a Chicago hardy fig. That's the hardiest fig that is out there. And, you know, for the last couple of years, it's been growing. It's survived winter just fine uh, because it is in that nice protected spot. But this year we've had our first harvest and we've had five figs Yay. on the plants. And they have been absolutely delicious. Now, I thought the figs that came from our plant would be kind of like meh. But they were outstanding, like mm. really, really good. So very exciting and a great example of uh, where there's a will, there's a way when now, it comes to gardening. Now the pressure's on because you're going to have to think about winter protection. Now that you know this is a performer, we got to keep it alive. Well, when it gets, yes. Yeah, so when it was smaller, it was easier. Uh, but I'm hoping that that southern exposure and the protection, because it's planted sort of in the corner of our house, mm -hmm. protected by two walls, we'll see what happens. Kind of a microclimate. It is a bit have. of a microclimate. So... Uh, great thing to look forward to in fall if you are so inclined, but we're not talking figs. We're not putting figs on trial today. Today's plant on trial is Legend of the Fall Father Gillow. And I know you're really excited about this. You actually suggested this plant on trial because you're so excited about all the fall color because it is hard to beat Father Gilla, also known as Bottle Brush. Yes. Also known as Witch Alder. Now, is it related to one of my favorite fall color plants, Witch Hazel? It is related. They're in the okay. exact same botanical family, the Hamamila Daisy. And um, the flowers Ooh, are, are... Hold on, back up for okay. our listeners keeping score <laughs> at home. That botanical name just went right past us because I have no idea how to pronounce that. One more time. Okay, so the botanical family, that Father Gilla and Witch Hazel, which is known botanically as Hamamilis, is the Hamamila Daisy. Hamamilla Daisy. Yes. So the Hamamilla Daisy family, two favorites there. <laughs> and uh, so Witch Alder, actually, that that common name does come from its relationship to Witch Hazel. Um, it's actually not an alder. Um, but Bottle Brush, do you think that our listeners know what a Bottle Brush looks like? I would think so. Some yeah. of them, maybe. Yeah, some of them. <laughs> It's funny when plants have these, you know, vestigial names that people are like, what's a bottle brush? Um, but if you know what a bottle brush looks like or you look it up, you will see that the flowers of the Father Gilla do indeed resemble bottle brushes. Now, they appear in spring. So we're talking about Legend of the Fall and is for everything that it offers the landscape in autumn. But it's also fabulous in spring when it flowers. The oh, flowers are fragrant, attract a ton of pollinators. I have some photos of them uh, covered in snow in early oh. spring, a late, you know, a late snow. Just, just gorgeous. Bloom. So unusual, just like witch hazel blooms. Yes. Very unusual. Very unusual, but they're white. So witch hazel, of course, is yellow. The Father Gilla uh, flowers are, are white. And, you know, the thing that is really great about Father Gilla is that we were talking about how some trees turn one color, Father Gill is a shrub, by the way, but how some woody plants will turn just one consistent color and some will have a mix of colors. Father Gilla is always a mix. And one thing that's really cool about it, and you see this with a lot of plants that turn a mix of colors, is the inner leaves that are the most shaded by the plant itself turn golden. And then the outer leaves are the ones that turn red and purple and orange. Okay. And that almost gives it a look as though it's lit from within, yeah. like there's a fire inside it. Oh, and uh, it. so it's, it really is beautiful. Now, as the name Legend of the Fall suggests, this uh, plant truly is legendary in the fall. Now, all Father So Gillis, we're not talking a Brad Pitt movie here. I don't think, was Brad Pitt in Legend of the Fall? Yeah, I think oh, he was. Okay. I've never actually seen the I'm movie. I'm going to have to look it up. Everyone's <laughs> running for the search engine of their choice yes. to look it up. I think Brad Pitt was in Legends of the Fall. Okay, I'd, I'll, I'll take your word for okay. it. Wherever you stand on the movie spectrum, Legend of the Fall is a great garden plant uh, because um, it was selected for this consistent fall color. Now, like I said, all Father Gillis are going to get some good fall color. But there is an issue of consistency. There's two factors that go into how much fall color a plant develops. Okay. A uh, cultural, so if we have good conditions like we were talking about with the cool cool nights and warm sunny days, if the plant gets enough sun, if your plant's not getting enough sun, a lot of times you'll see that its fall color will be kind of muddy. So that's the cultural side of fall color. Okay. But there's also a genetic side. There is sort of a uh, ultimate limit of color that a plant is capable, any one plant is capable of producing. So Legend of the Fall was selected in Massachusetts by one Brian McGowan for this really, really consistent, fantastic, vivid fall color. Now, Brian and his wife, Alice, ran Blue Meadow Farm, which is a very popular specialty nursery in Massachusetts. They've since sold their property to focus on other projects. But as with so many of us, gardening never really leaves you. So he's been dabbling around in some plant uh, breeding and plant production. 
And he is the one who brought Legend of the Fall Father Gilla to the proven winners. Gorgeous. Line. Gorgeous. Now, I want to say that uh, Father Gilla is a great landscape plant. Uh, do you have it in your garden? I have it. And let me stop you right there a moment for our listeners at home who are keeping score and want to look this up. Because I love the way you say that, Father Gilla. It almost sounds like Father Gilla. Uh, and yeah. I always said Gia, but uh, it's not. You're right. Because it's named, I guess, after Dr. John Father Gill, um, who was a Quaker physician, philanthropist of London, and he had a uh, he had a friendship uh, with uh, William Bartram. Oh, so it goes uh, back in very the US. far. So it goes way back seventeen hundreds. Yeah. So Father Gia, for people who are trying to look it up right now, F O T H E R. Yes. G I L L A. Yeah. And has the funny name because of Dr. John Father Gill. Yes, that's okay. correct. You there know, we, the, we could go on about uh, British scientists and yeah. plant names because that does sort of inform uh, how names are pronounced. Another great example would be Forsythia. What we say is Forsythia in the U.S. Well, it was actually named after a Dr. Forsyth. And if you are in the U.K., they say Forsythia. Oh. So, you know, this is a situation where it's probably better to be understood than right. Because if you go into your garden center and ask if they have any Forsythia, they're probably going to give you a bit of a funny look. So in the U.S., we'll stick to Forsythia. You, know, you talk yeah. about the U.K. I was reading the first recorded collection of a Father Gilla was by Dr. Alexander Garden, uh-huh. a Scottish physician. What a great name, Alexander Garden. I'd love to have a name like that. And you know what? That connects back to Father Gilla because one of the most popular garden species of Father Gilla is Father Gilla Gardeni, which was named for him. So you got it. What's in a name? A lot when it comes to plants. <laughs> uh, so great landscape plant. And you know, Rick, I, I wanted to ask you if you grew it because I don't grow it because I can't grow it. Uh, deer? No, no. It's deer resistant, actually, which okay. is great news. Why I can't grow it is because my soil is pure sand and uh, my yard is very, very dry. Mm. And Father Gilla is definitely one of those plants that you're going to want to plant uh, in acidic soil, which my soil is like neutral to slightly acidic, so that could probably work. But I just do not have any moisture. I'd have to dig in so much compost and do so much work, so I kind of just live with what I have. And I know you live on the lake shore as well. So I was wondering if you have trouble growing it in your sandy soil. It is difficult. Uh, the oak tree roots also, uh-huh. there are a lot of oak trees. So yeah, it's difficult. That that means that soil preparation is uh, so incredibly important, including collecting up those leaves this time of the year yeah, to create that'll, compost. That'll definitely get, get an improvement. Now, my mom lives over in the Detroit area and has clay soil. And she has an absolutely beautiful father gilla that she's had there for many, many years. So if you have... Uh, your soil more on the clay side, you're going to do great with this. It doesn't really want like standing water, but any kind of, you know, moist, rich soil, clay soil, it's going to do fantastic for you. And as far as sun, even though it is a native woodland plant, you'll find it growing in the Blue Ridge Mountains, it is going to want full sun for the best flowering and fall color. But if you have part sun, it's probably going to do pretty okay. But I would not really push it to much less than four hours of sun each day. Uh, so it doesn't really need any pruning. If you did decide to prune it, uh, you would prune it after it flowers because it blooms on old wood. Um, so overall, it's a really beautiful, beneficial native shrub for landscaping that I would encourage you, if you have those conditions, to give a try in your landscape at home. Uh, if you need more information on Legend of the Fall Father Gilla, we're going to have all the information for you in our show notes at Gardening Simplified on air. Dot com And when we come back, we are going to be opening the gardener's mailbag to answer your questions. You won't want to miss it, so please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacey Hervella, and I'm here with Rick Weiss. We're going to open up that gardening mailbag, but before we do, we're going to go back in time a few weeks. Oh, uh, and great movie. <laughs> Jane Seymour? I I saw, actually, I think on the Grand Hotel Instagram that she is in Michigan for the, uh, what, Somewhere in Time? Yeah, Somewhere in Time. That's what it was. Sorry. (laughs) Not Back to the Future, (laughs) Somewhere in Time. Uh, And uh, But a few weeks ago, we had a question from a listener, 
and he said that his green peppers were turning brown. Yeah. And we threw out a couple of different ideas, including blossom end rot and, you know, a bunch of different ones. And, and I had written him back and I said, could you send us a picture? Because if we can see a picture, we can get you a correct diagnosis. And he did send a picture. And I have to tell you, listeners, my mind was a little bit blown when I saw the photo. Um, it was not at all what I was expecting. Mm. Um, you ever see a wine cork? Yeah. Okay. It looked like cork. No way. The whole pepper looked like it was cork. Yikes. And um, he had cut some of them open in the photos. And the inside looked perfectly fine. But the whole outside was just covered in this weird, thick, brown, corky growth. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I said, oh, my gosh, some of my eggplants actually did that same thing. I had assumed it was due to uneven watering because I was not the most vigilant about watering those eggplants. They mm -hmm. were sort of in the back corner of my deer exclosure, which made them easy to get missed by rain and, and watering. So that was my assumption. So I Googled it and started poking around, and I discovered that this damage is very distinctive and always caused by a cyclamen flower mite. What are they doing out there? A <laughs> cyclamen flower mite. It's a great question. So cyclamen, uh, a lot of our listeners may be familiar with. It's a gift plant that's right. very popular, usually more in spring. Uh, Valentine's like around Easter, Day. Yeah, Valentine's yeah. Day, Easter. Not so much around the holidays, but you do see them because mm -hmm. there's some nice red ones. So um, it kind of has like a flower that really beautiful silvery leaves and then the flower comes up on a stalk and kind of the flower, the petals are reflexed away from it. Um, and so it is specifically this mite. And what happens is it feeds on the plant when it's in flower and that fruit is starting to form Okay. and it, um, emits some secretions in there that causes the fruits, the resulting fruit to have this really strange corky growth. That's fascinating. Yes, it really was. I, I, I wrote him back and I said, I've really learned a lot researching your problem here. So this is very interesting. So, um, where those came from, it could have been from his greenhouse where he purchased them. Mites are super tiny. The mites that we're talking about, they're not even like the spider mites that you might actually be able to see on your plants. These are areophyid mites, like when we were talking about rose rosette disease, teeny, teeny, tiny, windblown. So, you know, it could have blown in from a greenhouse. It could have blown in from someone else's house or someone else's garden. They also are a frequent pest of strawberries. So uh, if someone has a strawberry patch nearby, they could come in from that. So very interesting discovery there. I will add those photos to the show notes so you can see for yourself and learn a little bit more about the cyclamen flower mites. So, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we do here on Gardening Simplified is we love to um, help you out with your problems. So please don't hesitate to reach out. If you do have a gardening question or problem or comment, you can just go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and fill out the contact form, or you can send us an email at help, H-E-L-P, at gardening simplified on air.com. So, Rick, what is our first gardener's mailbag question for today? Cyclamen flower mites. Yes. I might want to Google that. You know that? <laughs> I don't okay. think you'll see pictures of the mites, but you will see a picture of their damage. So. Fascinating. Uh, Sandra writes to us, Stacy, that her lilacs are budding out and leafing this fall. What do I do? And, you know, through the years doing a radio show and at a garden center, I often would hear about lilacs at this time of the year. Part of it is we recommend that you not prune lilacs at this time of the year because if the lilac is healthy, hopefully it has produced a nice, big, thick bud just hanging out and waiting for spring, right? That's correct. Yep. Lilacs bloom on old wood. So right now your lilac uh, would have its flower buds for spring 2023. But if weather's a little unusual or maybe there's some water stress or something going on there, from time to time in October, we may see plants like lilacs or another good example would be rhododendrons where there's a few, you know, there's always a few in the bunch that are kind of rowdy and, you know. Doing off. something unexpected. Yeah, doing something unexpected and blooming. I mean, I'm sure you've probably heard this often. I have seen it. You also see it very commonly with magnolias. There's certain magnolias that will throw out some flowers in fall. And I will be honest, I don't know the cause, uh, but I would... So my first question for Sandra is, are you sure it's not a reblooming lilac? Ah, that's uh, a good question. Because, you know, we do have in the Proven Winners Color Choice line, bloomerang reblooming lilac, and that blooms in late spring along with the other lilacs takes a little rest, and then it continues to produce flowers into the fall. Um, and in some years, we have even had them actually with flowers at Thanksgiving. 
wow. um, if we haven't had a lot of really hard freezes or frosts. So my first question is, if it's a reblooming lilac, then you know what? Your plant is actually doing what it should, and you don't really have a huge cause for concern. In addition to the Bloomerang uh, series, which we have, there is an old, old-fashioned variety called Josie, Jose or Josie, um, that is sort of the original reblooming lilac. So it's not, I wouldn't go so far as to call it reblooming, but it commonly puts out some flowers in the autumn. So I would first rule out, or if possible, um, if your plant is either of those, in which case, like I said, no cause for concern, totally doing uh, what's normal for it to do at this time of year. Um, but yeah, if a plant is really stressed, it very often will say, whoa, I'm going to make a last ditch effort exactly. to, to reproduce here exactly. and put out some flowers and see what happens. And maybe those seeds will be able to carry on my legacy. I don't know if I'll be around to spring. No, <laughs> not saying, Sandra, that your lilac is that stressed. But, you know, there's some things that you can't necessarily detect that seem stressful, you know, to the plant. Uh, another thing is if you fertilized excessively. Um, and, uh, you know, that's going to push a lot of growth. So we always recommend that people stop fertilizing perennials, shrubs, trees by about late July, because what that will do is give the plant a chance to kind of metabolize that last application of fertilizer and start to shut down the cues uh, based on the cues that it's getting from the weather and the day length and that kind of thing. All right. And then with, uh, of course, common lilacs or f- want to call them French lilacs, yes. vulgaris, whatever, you see them all over the place. That's part of the reason, Sandra, also we recommend to folks that the time to prune and don't be afraid to prune hard would be in spring right after they're done blooming. Not right after fall. they're done, yep. Jerry writes to us, I have a Norfolk Island pine that is outgrowing my house. It's huge. What do I do? Does anybody want it? Well, no, probably not. And I think you need to move. I don't know. You know, houseplants are very hot right now. And I think there's probably some people who would be only too happy Maybe. to take a huge Norfolk Island pine off your hands, Jerry. Well, uh, if you are interested, you know, maybe we can we can make a connection here. But, you know, email. by the way, it was Captain James Cook, his voyage in the South Seas where he stumbled upon Norfolk Island. And they found Norfolk Island pines, and what they loved was the the tree trunks were straight as a pin. And they thought these would make great ship mass. The problem is they snapped like a carrot. Right, because they're a conifer. So they are what's known as a soft wood. Mm -hmm. Um, So, Jerry, I do want to first of all say congratulations, because there are so, so many people who struggle to grow Norfolk Island pine and can't even really get it past year one much less to the point where it's about to take over your house. So you've got the magic touch, Jerry, and uh, that's great. So, you know, sometimes botanical gardens and that kind of thing will take a donation of an exceptional specimen. I know when I was going to school at the New York Botanical Garden, we frequently heard from people who had interesting houseplants that outgrew their house. So might be worth reaching out to a local garden if they would be interested in it. Um, otherwise, you know, if you can't find someone to take it off your hands, I think it's just time to start uh, all over again with a brand new Norfolk Island pine. Yeah, It's about to be the season where they are everywhere exactly. in stores because, you know, they, they sell them as like a little Christmas tree. Um, so, Jerry, congratulations. You truly have a green thumb and you had the great conditions to grow a plant that is very difficult for many people to grow. So nice work. Uh, And that concludes today's Gardener's Mailbag. But again, we're always happy to help. So don't hesitate to reach out, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we're going to talk branching news with Rick. Don't miss it. Okay, my friends, it's time for branching news. We don't do breaking news on the show, but we do branching news. She's Stacy Hervella. I'm Rick Weist. And Stacy, how about we dive into it? I can't wait. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to you about daylight saving <laughs> time. And by the way, having done radio for a number of years, I learned a long time ago, do not say daylight savings time or you will get lots of emails and calls. So I am making sure to, what's the proper word here? Enunciate daylight okay. saving time. Time. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, the first story in the warmer months, the average American does 53 hours of manual labor around the house and yard every month, according to new research. So that's pretty cool. 21 hours, almost a full day devoted to home related tasks. 32 hours goes into keeping the yard looking fresh. It was a 
survey conducted on behalf of uh, Cub Cadet. Mm. Uh, so if you do the math, I mean, if you're being paid uh, 53 hours, if you're being paid $10 an hour, that's worth 530 bucks if you were being paid. But of course, you're not being paid for that. Um, Your payment is the clean house. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. That's, that's a pretty good return. So um, six hours every month mowing the lawn, three hours edging the yard, four hours pulling weeds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the average American also takes three hours a week just thinking about their yard. Three hours thinking about it. I probably do, but I, I don't know if like my mom does. Thinking, just thinking <laughs> about the yard, what it would look like if I did this or I did that. That's well, why they put those think flamingos out there, right? <laughs> You know, one of the things I was reading this article and we'll link it in the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. So you can read it yourself. One of the things that stuck out to me is that the number one most dreaded outdoor chore was weeding. Well, we know that. Well, but at the same time, like I, I have a huge garden. Uh -huh. I mean, not a huge garden, but like most of my yard is garden. Very little of it is lawn. And I spend almost no time weeding outside of spring because once my plants grow in, they outcompete all the weeds. So the answer to less weeding is more plants. Competition. <laughs> Good plants, not, you know, let them outcompete the weeds. So that's that's my tip for uh, reducing yard work there. Well, talking about disliked chores, taking the crown for the most disliked chore is perhaps unsurprisingly weeds, as you said, Stacy. Uh, 43% of respondents. But what I thought was interesting, second and third place. So second place goes to cleaning the bathroom. Oh, yeah. No one wants to do Ooh, that. Yeah. Okay. So we're in agreement. And then the third one, interestingly enough, edging the lawn. Now, I can relate to this. I don't edge my lawn. I don't want to edge my lawn. I, I dislike edging my lawn. It is not a fun chore. It's loud. The, the noise <laughs> of a real edger that actually does a good job is really horrendous. I'd say it competes with leaf blowers for noises yeah. that I do not want to exactly. hear on a beautiful afternoon. So I hear a nicely edged lawn is a thing of beauty, but doing it is another thing entirely. Okay, so here it comes, daylight saving time. Now there's a lot of people, there's confusion because there's a new proposed federal bill uh, where we're going to eliminate this whole daylight saving time fallback thing. It's coming up November 6th of this year, but it's not this year. So if this bill were to pass, as I understand it, has not been signed yet or passed, it would be November 2023. So you're going to have to set your clock back again in a few No, I like setting the clock back. I am a proponent of standard time. Uh, it's called standard time for a reason, and it is based on the oh. actual day length. And, you know, I, I've, I'm a morning person, okay? My mom raised me to be a morning person, and I think a lot of other gardeners are morning people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, daylight saving time is really just an illusion as to where the light actually is. And if you want more light in your day, then just get up earlier. You can't pretend. <laughs> Stacy. <laughs> when it comes to daylight savings time, times have changed. <laughs> No, but okay. So even though my preference... I'm still in the dark on this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> my preference would be permanent standard time. However, I will actually be happy to just not change because I do find it very disruptive to change. But you know, another issue for us here on the Lakeshore, we're pretty much at the end or the edge of the Eastern time zone. Right. So even as it is already, you know, on some summer nights, you know, we're, our sun is setting at like 1030. I know. You know, all my friends with kids are like, I can't get my kids to bed. I have to get blackout curtains because they think it's party time because it's like, <laughs> looks like it should be seven o'clock at night. So uh, depending on where you live, I think that the way this all shakes out will be very interesting. And if it does actually pass, uh, I think that people are going to maybe find that there's a little more or less than they bargained for when they do live in permanent daylight saving time. If it happens we'll see regardless how this pans out it's our loss <laughs> h-o-u-r and stacy has told me if i have to spell out the pun it's not worth <laughs> it so i'll move along i still am trying to figure out how to adjust my sundial in my garden for daylight saving time but that's for another show okay uh i thought this was fascinating weighing in at forty-four thousand three hundred and twenty pounds 72 feet long the big idaho potato truck did you know there's such a thing uh, not until you sent me the link. I I was I looked at the picture. There is a picture. So I mm -hmm. that was a very large potato. Rolls down the road, eight thousand pound giant potato loaded on a truck, 
And uh, unfortunately, that truck was, uh, you know, doing their marketing thing in California this past week and got pulled over by a California Highway Patrol officer and ticketed. I guess if you speed with a large potato on the bed of your truck, you're going to get a ticket. (laughs) And why this is in branching news, I don't know. We're talking about, uh, you know. Taters well, it did, potatoes. If, uh, you know, and again, we'll link the article in the show notes, but I did um, read on and it goes on to talk about how mile, how long it would take to grow a yeah. potato that actually was that size. Yeah, because it's a fake potato. It is a okay? fake potato. You got to mention that. Yeah. And, and when you see the picture on our show notes, you will have no doubt as to and it's immediately a very fake potato. It's yeah. If you humongous. were to grow one of those, it would take you 7,000 years to grow. It would produce 20,217 servings of mashed potatoes. I mean... 7,000 years to grow. I mean, I, I think that's kind of the deal breaker right then and there because, you know... How are you going to grow a potato over 7,000 years? If they don't, you know, it's sooner or later, the thing will probably just rot. Like, I don't think yeah. they have unlimited potential to grow to flatbed size. So don't It all worry. sounds pretty half-baked to me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Sorry. Check for Stacy. Score. Yes, it is a fake potato, which makes it an imitator. Right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, I love this story out of Idaho, uh, it's the Coeur d'Alene area in Idaho. Shirley Armitage Howard created the Little Tree Library in her own front yard. So she had this like 110-year-old cottonwood tree. And yes, they get huge and uh, was cut down, but they had the stump left, a sizable stump. And she decided to put a roof on it, carve it out, add some lighting, a door, and now the shelves inside that stump are full of books available to borrow for free. What I would I would definitely call, you know, call her uh, just just an entrepreneur for doing something like that. that. What a great story! It is a great story, and you know, the, the little free library movement is very popular. I think probably a lot of our listeners maybe live in neighborhoods with several little free libraries. I sure do. When we're walking around, um, I see several of them. And a lot of them are very, very nice. But I have to say, this one definitely takes the cake for the most epic little free library I have ever seen. Um, It is gorgeous. She did. She's an artist and a librarian, I read in the article. And um, she really took it to the next level. So um, I think it was just absolutely delightful. And this is one I would highly encourage you to click through to the show notes so you can see it for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure to go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Put the show notes up there and the link. Check that out. But way to go, Shara Lee, there in Coeur d'Alene, Iowa. I, I'm sorry, Idaho. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, fantastic for creating this little book tree. When it comes to books and a tree, it was bound to happen, right? Hey, uh, by the way, next week, one thing I want to talk about yes. um, in branching news, we'll talk about it next week. How many salads do you eat in one week? The average American, according to a study, eats four, I think four or six, four salads a week. Yeah, that seems yeah. about right. Now, I read this article too, so I'll have some opinions to share when we talk Wonderful. about it next week as well. And we'll make sure to share that. Thank you very much to Adriana. Thank you to John Ilk back in the studio. And of course, always, thank you, Stacy. I find it to be a true kick in the plants to do this show. And thanks to our listeners. We really appreciate you tuning in. And we invite you back next week.